We are here today in front of the Monterey Custom House to commemorate an event that occurred 167 years ago on this spot. On July 7th, 1846, forces under the command of Commodore John Drake Sloat raised the American flag and declared California for the United States. An event, yes. This is an event that has come to be called Sloat's Landing. Sloat's actions and his proclamation to the inhabitants and the citizens of California secured America's goal of manifest destiny, a nation that stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and resulted in the admission of the Union of California as our 31st state a few years later. My name is Tom Diggins. I operate Monterey Walking Tours and it is my pleasure to be your Master of Ceremonies today and to represent the Monterey History and Art Association, our host. So in 1846, <laughs> Commodore John Drake Sloat commanded the U.S. Pacific Squadron of seven ships. He had his flagship, the frigate Savannah. He had four sloops, a schooner, and a transport. Sloat was a reliable and trusted officer, but he faced a daunting responsibility. His job was to protect the American shipping, American citizens, and American interests in the Pacific Ocean, from Valparaiso, Chile, to the Puget Sound, and from Hawaii to Monterey. It was no secret that America wanted California. 600,000 square miles of territory that was weakly controlled by Mexico. We wanted it because we wanted the access to lucrative commercial markets in Asia and in the Pacific. A year earlier, the Navy Department and President Polk had given Sloat his orders. Seize the capital, Monterey, if he learned that the United States was at war with Mexico. Now, Sloat was handicapped by slow communication and his distance from Washington. Sloat was forced to rely solely on his experience, judgment, and personal resources as a series of events occurred that compelled him to make crucial military and diplomatic decisions on his own. Intelligence reports that reached Sloat from American <coughs> Council Thomas Larkin here in Monterey outlined the chaotic political situation in California, the weakness of the government, and the strength of the military. Larkin also described the activities of Captain John C. Fremont, giving slow reason to think that the Army knew more than the Navy did. In May of 1846, the Savannah lay at anchor in Mazatlan, Mexico. First rumors, and then confirmed reports, reached Sloat about a battle in Texas on the Rio Grande. This could be the spark that he was waiting for. Sloat also received fresh orders, putting him on alert and stressing the importance of seizing Monterey in the event of hostilities. <coughs> Clear in concept, but short of detail, Sloat's orders directed him to confirm war with Mexico, seize the capital, and avoid antagonizing the local inhabitants. Essentially, Sloat's orders directed him to invade a foreign country without making anybody angry, <laughs> to act boldly but prudently at the same time. When he learned that the U.S. Navy had blockaded Veracruz on the Gulf Coast, Sloat sailed for Monterey, and he arrived here 24 days later on July 2nd. Already in the harbor waiting for him, the sloops Cyan and Levant, and Captain Montgomery in the Portsmouth was patrolling the San Francisco Bay. Sloat quickly learned that there was no Mexican flag to salute, there were no officials to greet, and there was no Mexican military to fight. Sloat conferred with Council Thomas Larkin. He allowed his men shore leave. He hosted a big Fourth of July party on board his ships, and he put the final pieces of his plan together, acutely aware of the military and diplomatic ramifications of his decisions, uncertain if he would be history's goat or hero. Finally, Sloat decided he would rather be known for doing too much than for doing too little. 
and on July 7, 1846, 167 years ago, Sloat directed Captain Mervine of the Cyan to lead 250 sailors and marines in an amphibious assault against the Custom House. Under the cover of the American warships, Mervine quickly protected his beach and established a perimeter here. A short delay ensued while a Mexican flag was first located, then raised, and then subsequently lowered in surrender. Purser Rodman Price of the Levant went on the balcony and read the proclamation that was written by Sloat and Larkin. An American flag with four rows of stars was unfurled to great huzzah. Since there were no military officers or Mexican officials in the vicinity of Monterey, the capital and the surrounding area was secured without a shot in anger being fired. Within a few days, Sloat and his captains controlled Monterey and the San Francisco Bay. Now I know what you're thinking. Tom, that's an exciting story. Why have I never heard of this before? And I don't know. I believe that Sloat's Landing is the most undocumented, unremembered, and unappreciated significant event in American history. The events are surrounded by controversy, contradiction, myth, m misinformation, and factual error. There are some who say that Sloat was slow to act, but I say that Sloat responded to the events as they unfolded deliberately and brilliantly. Let's look at Sloat's achievement. He successfully invaded a foreign country. He executed a textbook perfect amphibious landing. He took the capital, established a beachhead, and deployed his ships. There was no resistance. There was no looting. There was no incidents of any kind. Law and order was maintained. The Mexican military uh, was forced to flee before the power of the United States Navy and California became a state a few years later, and we fulfilled our goal of a country stretching from sea to shining sea. This is a remarkable accomplishment, a major event in American history, and it happened right here where we stand today. I believe that Commodore Sloat, his captains, and his men are true American heroes, and I am proud to play a role in this anniversary celebration of this auspicious occasion. There is little evidence that Sloat himself ever stepped foot in Monterey. While Captain Mervine directed the landing party, it was actually Rodman Price, who later became a senator from New Jersey, who read the proclamation. But uh, today, we will give that honor to Commodore Sloat. Proclamation to the inhabitants of California. The central government of Mexico, having commenced hostilities against the United States of America by invading its territory and attacking the troops of the United States stationed on the north side of the Rio Grande, and with a force of 7,000 men under the command of General Artijarista, which army was totally destroyed and all their artillery, baggage, etc. Captured on the 8th and 9th of May last by a force of 2,300 men under the command of General Taylor and the city of Matamoros taken and occupied by the forces of the United States and the two nations being actually at war by this transaction. I shall hoist the standard of the United States at Monterey immediately and shall carry it throughout California. I declare to the inhabitants of California that although I come in arms with a powerful force, I do not come among them as an enemy to California. On the contrary, I come as their best friend, as henceforward California will be a portion of the United States, and its peaceable inhabitants will enjoy the same rights and privileges 
they now enjoy, together with the privileges of choosing their own magistrates and other officers for the administration of justice among themselves. And the same protection will be extended to them as to any other state in the Union. They will also enjoy a permanent government under which life, property, and the constitutional right and lawful security to worship the Creator in a way most congenial to each one's sense of duty will be secured, which unfortunately the central government of Mexico cannot afford them, destroyed as her resources are by internal factions and corrupt officers who create constant revolutions to promote their own interests and to oppress the people. Under the flag of the United States, California will be free from all such troubles and expense. Consequently, the country will rapidly advance and improve both in agriculture and commerce, as of course the revenue laws will be the same in California as in all other parts of the United States, affording them all manufacturers and produce of the United States, free of any duty and all foreign goods at one quarter of the duty they now pay. A great increase in the value of real estate and the products of California may also be anticipated. With the great interest and kind feelings I know the government and people of the United States possess towards the citizens of California, the country cannot but improve more rapidly than any other in the continent of America. Such of the inhabitants of California, whether natives or foreigners, as may not be disposed to accept the high privilege of citizenship and to live peaceably under the government of the United States, will be allowed time to dispose of their property and to remove out of the country, if they choose, without any restriction, or remain in it observing strict neutrality. the colors. The flag raised that day had four rows of seven stars, 28 in all. With the flag only halfway up the pole, the halyard jammed. After first removing his shoes, Midshipman Higgins shinnied up the pole and freed the halyard, permitting the signal officer Toller to hoist the stars and stripes. We hopefully will not be recreating that part of the proceedings today. Thank you, Captain Hirsch Loomis, Commodore Sloat. Thank you again to the MHAA, to the uh, City of Monterey, to our friends at State Parks. Be sure to say thank you to a guy with a or lady with a bear on his shoulder. Uh, my name again is Tom Diggins. Been a lot of fun for me to be your master of ceremonies. You can Google me at Monterey, Washington.